Hi, I'm Christopher Warnock of Renaissance Astrology. This video I'm going to be talking about high and low intensity astrological interaction and devotional practices. This whole high low intensity thing is just sort of a modeling. It's a way of kind of classifying or understanding some differences between uh, various types of astrological practices. If you find it useful, great. If not, you know, it's no big deal. Um, so this intensity is this idea of you know, combining a lot of uh, high strength astrological factors or since having an intense interaction. Um, when you're talking about a devotional practice, which I do, the focus is much more on the, the interaction itself, you know, and informing a long-term relationship. We'll talk about this a little bit later, as opposed to, you know, sort of strength uh, being, be the more strength, the better. I mean, that's not always true or, or immediately getting what I want. So I think in terms of this high intensity practice, if you think about this, you have a friend, you want to get along with a friend better, or maybe it's like a romantic relationship or something. So you say, okay, let's go to, you know, uh, Acapulco for a weekend, you know. Obviously that's going to be, you're going to be with them 24 hours a day, doing all the stuff together, out of your normal stuff, that's going to be a pretty high uh, intense um, experience. Is that good or bad? Is that going to, you know, maybe it'll be helpful, maybe it'll put you under so much stress that you, you know, it will cost props for the relationship. Or you could see them, you know, um, you know, go over to their house and visit them for an hour, you know, and just hang out. I mean, that's a much more low intensity uh, practice. But then say you do that for a year, that's also can be really useful. So like I said, you, you kind of have to look at these practices in terms of, like I said, the intensity and not just think, oh, more is better. But look about the, look at the circumstances and decide what fits your, what your goals are and what your, you know, what kind of, uh, goes along with your personality or, you know, fits your, what you, what you like. So in terms of talking about different astrological practices, um, we can talk about the highest intensity as being using full uh, multi-chart, uh, excuse me, full multi-factor, full chart elections. Um, so, uh, and then they would have consecration and invocation and then the creation of a talisman. So this is the highest intensity interaction you can have. You're looking at multiple astrological factors that line up. They don't do that very often, so you're going to have to wait a long time for those uh, factors to line up. But when they do, you can have a very intense encounter uh, with that spirit, or you could, if you want to look, think of an energy, you're going to have the maximum amount of the energy of that, that particular astrological factor or planet. You're then doing a consecration. So you're not just sort of passively you know, letting those factors unfold. You're actually going out there and you're coming into contact with the spirit, and you're uh, you know, consciously asking if, you know, for an interaction. And then you're creating a talisman. And I do think there's a sense that the talisman itself, I mean, again, depending on how you conceptualize it, if you, a lot of people are going to think of it as a battery, it's being charged at that point. So it's holding the energy. Another way to think about it is, is, is like almost like a being, and you're ensouling it. That's another way of thinking about it. Or another way of thinking about it is, like I said, it's like, I tend to think of a talisman as like a portal, you know, a means of contact. Um, you know, a, like a cell phone or something, a walkie-talkie. And if you've got this, you've got an immediate way of contacting, it, um, you know, the, uh, the spirit, the angel in a very, in a very uh, again, high-intensity way. Um, so, um, and you know, again, you know, typically, you know, the, the sources talk about, you know, the more permanent the material, the longer lasting, the stronger the talisman. I mean, that's sort of the concept of it, you know, is that the material. I mean, I'm not sure how much credence I put on material. I do like talismans at school to have them, um, and I do think if they keep their basic form, um, that they're going to continue to be useful as part of a, as a way of contacting the spirit. I don't think that they wear out. I don't think that they somehow disappear, you know, in terms of the in, in intensity because of, you know, like the, the period of time going by. I think you can take that talisman, reconsecrate it, and then restart up a relationship with it. Just like if you don't use a cell phone for a while, you know, I guess if you got to charge it, I suppose it's doesn't fit the metaphor, but it still works, you know what I mean? As long as you get it, get it going again, it still works. So then the next level in terms of intensity would be just doing a consecration or an invocation, but doing it with a full chart multi-factor election. So again, you've got, again, high intensity, you've got this brief period of concentrated focus, multi-factor election with a lot of, you know, collection of the whatever, you want to think about energy or occult virtue, it's all concentrated. Um, and again, it doesn't happen very often. So, you know, another way to look at it again is the platonic idea of the, of the astrological factors expressing itself very strongly at that particular moment. It's sort of, in a sense, dominating that moment. So those are, those are the sort of high intensity interactions. So then in terms of low intensity, probably the, the key, you know, thing about a low intensity interaction is that you're not using multi-factors. 
for the election. You're doing typically like a single or dual factor election. So um, these are relatively, uh, you know, a, a low intensity interaction. Uh, but then what you do typically is do lots of repetitions. So you can do it much more frequently. And with a, a single factor, you know, you might be able to do it every day. You know, you might be able to do that, um, you know, depending on what you're looking at. Um, so, for example, the daily planetary practice, again, you can see the link to that. You uh, time by a planetary day. So the planet, the rules of the planet, the day you invoke, you can do it at a planetary hour if you want to. I tend to just do it at a set time, like in the evening, uh, planetary day. Um, and then you do that every day. So you, you really are getting a very low intensity interaction with that planet uh, because it's only planetary day, um, which is not, you know, not a super strong factor all by itself. Um, but you're doing it regularly. And I've done the daily planetary practice now for like probably almost 20 years. Um, so um, one of the newest uh, practices that I've done is a, a fixed star practice. Um, and I'm doing this on a daily basis. Now that's kind of heavy duty. Um, what I'm doing is timing by the fixed star rising or culminating. Um, you really have to be dedicated to do a daily fixed star practice because the time is shifting three to five minutes earlier every day. So you have to make this effort. What I end up having to do is I have a to-do list saying, you know, I'm doing algal, basically, algal on the Pleiades. So I say, okay, you know, I got a, a, a to-do, you know, a reminder every day, and then I have to look and set based uh, on, a, on the chart when that's going to be, and then I do another reminder for the specific time. I suppose you could do it ahead of time. You could do it for, like, going through every day and do it, but I just end up doing it every day. So... It's kind of disruptive your schedule too because it keeps changing. It starts moving into these other times and you can't really get a habitual time when you're doing it. Um, so um, that's a little bit more intense, I think, in some ways because the devotion that it takes is higher. The energy I'm having to put into doing this is higher. So I think that there's an intensity that's, that's greater in a sense of the fixed star practice than the planetary practice. Um, uh, the, the, the flip side is because it's more difficult to do, I'm probably not going to keep it up. And in fact, during parts of the year, you can use rising or culminating. Both the rising and culminating times are like, you know, like at 3 a.m. or something. One's at 3 a.m. One's, you know, one's really late, one's really early. You know, so for a, a month or so, I, I really couldn't do it as a practical matter. I didn't really want to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. So I stopped. And there was a noticeable, it was interesting, I'm algos and protective towels, and I did feel like I was sort of, sort of unprotected for that period. But I'm like, okay, that's, that's, I was okay with it. Um, you know, it just kind of goes, you know, it's one of those things, there's an ebb and flow to everything. There's a, you know, sometimes it's summer, sometimes it's winter. And as much as you like summer, you guys going to have a winter, you know, day and night. So I felt like it was appropriate to have some downtime. It was appropriate if there's going to be some more problems that were coming up because they didn't have the protection. Well, that, that was, you know, that just comes, goes with the territory. Um, it's part of the whole rhythm stuff. So we've got the planetary practice, the daily fixed star practice. And the other one I was realizing that's also a practice that I do is the monthly mantra, mantra practice because the moon orbits the earth. You know, it takes uh, 27.5 days, goes through all 28 mansions in that 28-day period. Um, and so approximately once a month, the moon's going to be in the appropriate mansion. And the, the two mansions that I, I'm really focused on are the third mansion and the seventh mansion. So every uh, month when the moon goes into the third mansion, the moon goes into the seventh mansion, I do separate invocations for those uh, mansion lords. And um, so that's also a, you know, I would consider that to be a, a low intensity practice. Uh, not as hard to time. I, mean, I do have to, you know, look on the calendar. Every time I do it, I'd say, okay, go ahead for the next month and put them on the calendar. And, you know, I have a tickler that reminds me, you know, that it started. And I basically, as long as the moon's in the mansion, I don't do anything more fancy than that. Just get the moon in the mansion. And I'll typically do it in coordination with my evening daily planetary ritual. I just kind of add the moon mansion uh, ritual into it for that day you know, that I do it. So that's that's how I basically take care of it. So that's, you know, again, another high intensity practice. I've been doing the third and seventh mansion for years now. So again, that helps to build up the uh, that relationship. And, uh, you know, again, that's a, a useful practice to do. So the lowest intensity to practice is plan what I would plan your charity. So plan your charity, you're going to do an invocation, single factor election, usually the day, you can also do the hour. Um, and then you make a vow to make a donation to the, the children of the planet. You know, like Saturn, for example, would be homeless people. And you would do that, you know, uh, donation in the, in the day and hour, or at least at least the hour of the planet. Um, I think this is, again, is a, a low intensity. Again, we're using basically one or two factors. Um, there's a little more energy in, added into it because you have to make the, the vow and you got to be on time and do the stuff. Um, but, you know, you're not doing this for yourself. 
you know, it's, it's very much non, you know, ego based. Uh, it's very beneficial karmically, um, you know, and I think that that's, um, you're benefiting another person directly as opposed to any kind of benefit for yourself. Um, so again, I think this is a, a, a really very, very low intensity practice, which means it's safe for everybody, no matter what the state of the planet is in your chart or what other things you can, you can I think, almost always do planetary charity for the planet. I mean, if you did some divination and said no, then that would be, you know, that would be the final thing or your intuition. It's going to be your choice. But for the most part, you can be pretty confident that planetary charity is, um, you know, a safe practice. So you can get, you can see links. I'm going to link to the daily planetary practice and planetary charity. The fixed star practice and the moon mansion practice. I mean, again, moon mansion practice, all you got to do is there's some lunar, you know, I'll put the lunar, uh, there's a lunar uh, mansion calculator that I like, I'll put up there. And, um, you know, you can use that just to time the mansions if you got to, if you want to do mansion invocation. So, you know, it's it's cool how I'm kind of filling out my practice. Like I said, I've got, you know, obviously make talismans. I'll do that from time to time if I'm really interested in a particular talisman. I have a tendency to make paper talismans. Um, and again, if you reconsecrate those, that I don't think that loses the connection. Um, you know, obviously I have a whole bunch of metal talismans because that's part of the business. So I, have, I probably have 50 metal talismans on various altars. Um, and then I'm doing the daily planetary practice the fixed star, daily fixed star practice for the, the fixed stars I've chosen and the um, m monthly moon practice. Now, what you could do with the fixed star practice, I think, you know, I just thought of this recently because someone said, isn't it hard to do it for a long period of time? What you could do for the mansion, excuse me, for the fixed star practice is like the mansion practice, you can make a vow. Say, I promise to you that I will do the daily fixed star practice for a month or I'll do a certain number of repetitions, you know. That would be a good way to do it. Or when you, you know, if you're going to stop, you just say, okay, this is the end. I'm not going to be able to do it anymore and I'll, I'll see you again, but thank you. Keep protecting me, or you know, or keep bringing your benefits. Um, so that's another way to do that fixed star practice. But it's nice to kind of have build up these these practices. Now, my focus is devotional, so it's like prayer. You know, and if you you know if you cared about somebody and they had cancer, you'd go to you know, like if you're Catholic, go to church. You could do a novena for them. You know, get all sorts of prayers, and you'd recognize that you know prayer is helpful. It can be very powerful. Miracles can happen, but it's you know, it's in, in terms of what's going to happen or not, it's kind of hit or miss. I mean, it may happen or may not happen. If you're looking for something very specific and very powerful like that, it may or may not happen. You know, and part of it is this, like, and again, there's not this idea that, you know, we're going to get, the Virgin Mary didn't want do what she's supposed to do, so we're going to kick her butt. I mean, this is, this, this is a very strange, would seem like a very strange mindset to be in. I mean, this is a very powerful, very benign being, but you can't force them to do anything. Uh, and they're going to do what they think is best, you know. And sometimes I've seen that I've there's you know I'll see this stuff saying you know I saw something recently saying you know magic is more than begging gods for you know for um, charity. And I'm like, yeah, it is. I mean that's a little bit of a pejorative way of putting it. It's sort of like you know working is more than just begging your job for you know begging your boss for you know money. It's like I don't know if I'd exactly characterize a job that way, you know, nor I'd characterize the devotional practice that way. And I and it's true there's are other ways of doing it. My feeling, though, is that any being that I can force to do what I want isn't a very powerful spiritual being. You know, if I can go in there and kick their butt around so that they have to do what I want them to do, um, you know, that's a, a different issue. I think there's also this idea that underneath this is like the intensity, like the strength is like, I want the maximum strength because I want to get what I want. You know, and so people are going to look at this video and say, okay, that sounds interesting, Chris. Which of these is going to get me what I want? And I guess what I would say about that with the devotional practice is, again, um, you know, that may not be the, that's not really a devo how devotional practice works. Uh, devotional practice is focused on having that relationship. And I think there's a lot of enjoyment in doing the ritual itself. I mean, I mean, even from an OCD standpoint, I mean, I like the ritual. I sort of feel like it, you know, it's beneficial to me. Um, and I feel like not focusing immediately on the results is a useful way to, to get results. It's sort of a Zen thing. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I'm not necessarily doing this because I, you know, I have a specific result I want to get, nor am I going to stop doing it because I don't get exactly what I want. You know, again, I think it's beneficial to interact with these beings. I think I get a lot of good stuff out of it. You know, and I have a feeling that actually I probably, you know, may, in terms of the concrete goals that I have in my life, you know, even though I'm not focused on that magically, I've actually been able to accomplish a lot of stuff. So if you really want to get, you know, good results, maybe you should quit worrying about results. Um, but, you know, again, the, the, I think that the friendship idea is a good way to, to think about this. It's like if, if somebody's like, 
I want to be friends with you because I want to get stuff from you. And that's the only reason I'm going to be friends with you is I'm going to get something from you. You don't want to be friends with that person, you know? And, you know, like this idea of like, what's, what's the best for the relationship? You know, like I said, in terms of intensity, do I want to go to go away for the weekend with them? Right? Or I want to stop by their house. I mean, again, the, the question is, what's the best way to have a close relationship? Or even better than, more than that, is like, what would be more fun? You know, ultimately, what's, you know, what's the most enjoyable interaction? So I think that's another way to think about this is to say, you know, really a lot of the devotional practice is just because it's an enjoyable interaction. You know, you have a short, you know, period where you're, the incense is kind of intense, you have this beautiful altar, you've got this beautiful, I mean, people send me their altar pictures all the time. They're really often really gorgeous. And to set this up and I've had this, it's enjoyable, you know, and I can use my artistic ability to kind of create stuff and what would the spirit like and things like that. It's like a friend, you know, coming over, what would they like to eat, you know, something, maybe there's a little treat for them that they would appreciate show your, you know, how much, you know, you value their friendship. So I said, this is a different model. And there's nothing wrong with getting stuff. And I, I certainly need to get stuff myself. But I don't think I want that to be my entire, how I interact with the entire reality it's in terms of like, what can, how can I get something out of it, you know, and how can I get, give, force people to give me stuff? Or how can it make the external world be the way I want it to be? Because, you know, this idea that I, I, like I said, this idea that, oh, you know, you know, they'll do what's best for me. That's ridiculous. It's like, well, you know, if you're a kid, you do think that. You're like, oh, I want what I want and my parents are idiots. When you get to be older, then you're like, you know, maybe my parents weren't so stupid after all when they weren't letting me stay out till 3 o'clock in the morning or they didn't tell me not to use heroin. Maybe that wasn't such a bad idea. So, you know, that's what I would say about it is there's a certain amount of arrogance in assuming that I know what's best for me and that I should just use maximum power to grab onto it whenever I can. So, like I said, that's fine. If that's the approach you want to take, go ahead. But recognize that there's other ways to go. And that's what I'd say about devotional practice is that clearly this is an alternative and the intensity is a kind of a useful way of, of slotting into that and recognizing that maybe the most high intensity, you know, uh, interaction isn't, gonna, isn't what's, you know, going to fit what my goals are and what I'm, what I'm looking for uh, in terms of how I have this, this, uh, this relationship. So, again, I'm... I've provided some links in there, like I said, to the various practices. I'm, like I said, I'm starting to fill that out in terms of this having this almost complete devotional practice with all the different astrological factors. I haven't quite figured out what to do with the decans and faces yet. And, um, but I'm kind of, you know, working on all these different, you know, ways of having a devotional approach uh, to all the, the celestial uh, factors and celestial spirits. So I think that's very useful. I help people that are attracted to the devotional approach find it interesting. Recognize you can sort of see how I've, you know, the thought process I have, and then you can adapt that to fit you. Because I think the key with the devotional practice is doing it, you know, having an interaction that is enjoyable for you, that's uplifting and inspiring. Um, if it's if it's dull, if it's something that's a drag to do, then it's that's not that's not a good spirit to be doing about it. it Maybe even be counterproductive to be doing it if that's the way you're going about it. So good. I hope you find that useful, and I hope you find it those practices fun. Uh, and enjoyable and uh, beneficial.